All right, well, hello and welcome to episode 30, apparently, of Fireside Palaver. Um, I think we should, I, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning the name, David. I don't know, I don't know. We haven't talked about this yet. I'm, I'm springing it on you on the show, and I'll cut it out if it's a bad, if it's a bad take. But I like Fireside, but I don't know about Palaver. I don't know that people are picking up on the Palaver thing. And really? we've gotten to where we talk about more than just Stephen King, so I feel like we need a, we need a, a less... We need something that invokes that type of Lord. fiction, but it's not just that. And so I don't know what other play we could have on Fireside, but there, um, there's got to be a fire, Fireside podcast out there. So that, that, that's that got to be taken. Right. Uh, fireside. I don't know. We need to do a we need to start a chat back and forth where we, we decide or we just stick with Fireside Palaver and complain about the name forever. That could be our new bit, is that we hate the name, but we can't think of anything new, so we just stick with it. I, I don't know. I, I would be open to that, too. Um, Fireside Coffee Chats and Comics. Who knows? Oh, uh, yeah. See, that's the thing, too, is I changed the uh, YouTube channel to Fireside Comics and Fantasy, not posted a single comic video. <laughs> so, I know, right? We talked about comics and yeah. stop talking about comics. <laughs> so it's not a... I don't think if I don't think it deserves a place in the channel name. We need we need to, uh, but I like the Fireside Fantasy. Fireside Fantasy. I bet Fireside Fantasy podcast is is available. That's that's yeah. pretty. Oh, yeah, that that's good. And yeah. that's the FFP show. That seems pretty good. We could go with that. The FFP show. I don't know. We'll decide by the next episode. Um, and also speaking of the next episode, we'll decide by the next episode. Hopefully like soon i want to wait more than two weeks when we do these episodes that's all on me we were just talking about that before i started recording um but i want to start doing more episodes the only way we're going to attract people to the channel is if we do at least a weekly show it probably should be more than once a week um but this week we've got giant turtles brando sando news and uh let's see what else do we have in the news oh New D&D esque D&D esque RPG Daggerheart, uh, as well as we're going to do our reading check in with uh, um, Howling Dark. I always want to say the Howling Dark, but it's just Howling Dark. Did we decide what was it? Um, was it Rukio? What did Chris Rukio? 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 like. <laughs> I heard his name spoken, and then like now I forgot how they said it. I think it was Ruk- Ruk- Rukio. Yeah, Rukio. I think you just, it's one of those, you just say it yeah. quick enough that people don't notice you said it wrong. Exactly. Um, Christopher R. Yeah, Christopher R. There you go. I we'll, we'll dive into Howling Dark at the end, but I'm enjoying the, the franchise. But this book, we were going to do Dune. And last episode, I talked about, oh, yeah, let's do Dune. And then this week we're coming back and we're doing Howling Dark. I just, I started reading Dune. I read like a few pages into it. And then I just, I started thinking about images from the movie. And I just felt like I didn't want to do the movie book thing right now. And so I backed out. I messaged you at like 11.30 p.m. and said, hey, let's don't do Dune. Let's, let's, because I didn't want you to be like reading the first three chapters of Dune all night. And then. Then have to change books. Um, have you had any, like, this is one of the first times that I've seen a movie and then read the book instead of the other way around, you know? Right. Oh, yeah. Do you find that makes it harder? Yeah, well, it, it kind of goes both ways. So, like, yeah, if I really like a book and then they make an adaptation of it, I'm always nitpicking it. Yeah, you almost don't want to watch it. Right. And then, like... Um, and then if it's, well, what surprised me a lot of times is I'll watch a movie and then realize oh. afterwards that there's a book and I'm like, oh, okay. And then like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I'll happens all the time. Uh, I'll do the, I'll read the book and I, I think I like, I mean, in, in reality it's probably better that way. Cause I feel like I can appreciate both more. If you do it which I, way. If I would see the movie first. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. I because like, I mean, books are so much more in depth. Yeah. And and you know, you, you get this the plot and like especially internal dialogue. Like if you read a book 
that has a ton of internal dialogue and then they make it into a movie and yeah. it's hard to do internal dialogue for a movie. Yeah. And so like they have to do something else to try and bring that out. And, you know, sometimes it's hit or miss. Yeah. And of course, with Stephen King, you know, being my favorite author, his books it's, are a lot of times hard yeah. to do. Um, I'm really looking forward to, but a lot of attempts, um, there's a lot yeah. of there's a there's lot, lot of Stephen of King yeah. movies, yeah. Um, there's a there's a show coming out. I think it's going to be on Amazon. I'm assuming because it's um. Oh, it's the it's the I know who you're talking. Yeah. I know who you're trying to think of. Because yeah. he left uh, <laughs> Netflix and went to Amazon. Yeah. Um, is he's the guy that's going to do the Dark Tower? Yeah. 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 God, I can't think of his name, but he's. I'll got, Google he's, it while you're talking. <laughs> um, I feel like it's Mike something. I don't know why I can't. But anyway, he's doing a, uh, he's adapting a short story called The Life of Chuck. And it's a really ah, strange. Mike Flanagan. It's in his Mike song. Flanagan, that's it. <laughs> um, but it's a very strange short story. And everything I've heard about it, everyone says it's fantastic adaptation. Mm. And so I'm looking forward to that. It's um, Did you ever see Memento? Yes. Yeah. So it's memento like where it starts at the end of this guy's life and kind of goes back. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really neat. Uh, it's a really neat story, and I'm um, I'm very excited for that. But yeah, like I don't know. Uh, he's got a good track record. He does. He's got a good yeah. track record. I know Stephen King and, fans, of which I now am one. There was a time period where I could say I wasn't one, but I, I now am one thanks to this podcast. And uh, yeah, it's got a. a Good track record. People people yeah. love the Mike Flanagan. And I really hope that we see that Dark Tower adaptation. I really hope that's a real thing. I think, so the only movie that I could think of that I saw before reading the book is uh, the Dark Tower, which we've said a bunch of times, the movie's got nothing to do with the book. But still, still, I see Idris Alba, even though exactly. they don't even describe Roland in the first couple of books, except for being like this leathery, monstrous, like, like right. a hunk of a man. Um, but they never like describe like skin, to- skin tones or his build or anything like that until like three books in. But I still think of Idris Alba, even though he's like a right. white, slim, tall guy. Um, <laughs> so that's, I wouldn't say ruined me, though. He's a good actor. Um, yeah, definitely. But, uh, see, like, I'm lucky because, like, <laughs> I always think, and which kind of, you know, John, he, um, he, John I, Wayne, I Clint, Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Clint Eastwood. Um, no, I, I definitely could see that, too. That's that's the uh, that's the real archetype would be Clint Eastwood. Yes, definitely. Um, but and speaking of and speaking of Stephen King, and yeah, other news, got giant um, turtles. So tell me the, tell me about this. I don't know. I haven't read this article. So tell me about this giant turtle. So <laughs> scientists and I'm trying to remember where it was. They discovered a a, a fossil of um, a giant like. I guess a really big giant turtle um, between uh, 40,000 and 9,000 years old uh, from the Brazilian Amazon. Oh, wow. Um, Its species is one of the largest known freshwater turtles in the world, Um, but they named it uh, Maturin, which is, Mm. you know, the giant turtle, which is one of the guardians of the beam. Yeah. Um, and, and Stephen King. And if, if, you know, he actually showed the turtle shows up in in a few other things like it, you know, mm. you know um, things like that. So like, uh, that's really cool. Like, you know, all these scientists, nerdy guys are like, yeah, you know, obviously one of them was a huge <laughs> Stephen King fan. Yeah. And they're like, Holy crap, a big turtle. Let's call it Matron. Like, that's really cool. Like I like when, when they, yeah, you know, kind of do cool names for for new species and stuff. If you could name something, if you if you got a chance to name something, a, a distant star, a new island, a new species, what would it be that you would name, and mm-hmm. what would you name it if it were something from a book? I already have an answer. Oh, go ahead. I'm glad I moved my desk to this side of the room so I can reach over and grab books now. 
All right. I, I've done this. When I used to play in a band, this was like three or four bands ago, I had a song called The Five and a Half Minute Hallway, which is a reference to House of Leaves. There's right. a, a video they make in the book where they're they're trying to illustrate how the house is larger on the inside than the outside. Um, and they call the video the five and a half minute hallway. But I think I think saying I'd name a song that is a cop out. So like if there was ever some if I if I ever had the chance to name some theory or some like, you know, some metaphysical uh, theory of some kind, I think I would call it the five and a half minute theory or the five and a half minute hallway theory or something. The five and a half minute hallway method. <laughs> I can't get this back on the so, shelf now. I'm going to go more of the um, planet naming yeah. comedy thing. So if I if there was a new planet discovered, Omicron um, per CI eight. <laughs> Omicron per CI eight would be it. Like, <laughs> was that really it? That was it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's so good. And they would have to announce it in that voice, too. Oh, my God, Percy I8. Oh, my God, Percy I8. <laughs> That's hilarious, I guess, that. <laughs> Out of all the things in the world, it could have been. I know, right? <laughs> and, yeah. the, and the moon, the moons of the planet would have to be like Kiff and like... <laughs> Yeah, anytime I'm playing a game with Elliot or something and I have to make up the name of uh, some celestial planet or something, I always, I always say Omicron per CIA. It's hilarious. It's, all, it's awesome. So, yeah. yeah, so Giant Turtles. Turtles. Giant Turtles. The, and, we've, we have found the defender of the beam and it's dead. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're doomed. <laughs> we're all doomed. That's crazy. That's crazy. Turtles, turtles as pets, man. You could get a pet yeah. that could outlive you. That likely will outlive you. Exactly. Although it's not all turtle. We we associate that to like all species of turtles. But I looked into right. getting Elliot a turtle one time, and the lifespan was like six years. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how you choose the ones that live I forever. Think it's I think it's the the tortoise. It's the I tortoises think, that live a long time. Live yeah, longer. yeah. Cooper had been talking about wanting to watch Walking Dead for a while, and we had started it, and then I uh, made it ten minutes in the first episode, and then stopped. And then, like the other day, we started watching again. I think I told you this. That, and then Julie came home, and. Right when we were on the first episode, like 10 minutes in, she was like, oh, what are y'all watching? We were like, Walking Dead. And she was like, ew, Walking Dead. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to like that. And I was like, well, you know, this is what happened. You know, spoilers for anybody that hadn't watched the show. Yeah, spoilers, it's been out 14 spoilers, spoilers. years. Yeah, 14 for... years now or however long it's been. I Nobody, think up I don't now. think that show carries interest with outside no. of its own group. Like, there's people that still watch the show. Right. Oh, definitely. I don't think outside of that group, I don't think it's picking up many you think it'll be like lost one day where like it has this big resurgence years later i think once they completely finish it yeah they, maybe they will. yeah um, but yeah so like she started watching and now it's like every night she's the one like what are y'all mm. doing We're in here watching an episode we're already on season three. Oh wow um, you know uh lori just had the baby yeah, and uh, you know the governor's in full swing and all that stuff, and uh, yeah, Merle's back. You know, and I forgot. You know, that was a really good show. Yeah, and those, those and those, first seasons yeah, were really, really good. good. Yeah, were really good. Like, um, it got I, too big, man. It got it got so big that like they, in a way, this is terrible to say, but in a way, it got so big that they would have been negligent if they didn't milk it a little bit. Like right. it was like it just turned into like this money, this money cow that you know it was like all right, well, show's right. over now. We gotta have eight spinoffs and then yeah. keep this thing going and blah blah blah. So, but you know, both of them have been enjoying it, and you know, it just blows me away how much like she is very much into the show. And, yeah. Um, Becca wants know, to go I, back. Becca wants to watch it again. She wants to watch it, and she wants to watch the new stuff. 
Right. Well, I'm very interested. Like, so the the Fear of the Walking Dead. Yeah. I, I, I probably am not going to watch that. I, like, I think I watched the first season ish of that show, and it doesn't really have anything. You know, it's kind of a separate entity, other than you know Morgan becomes a character in that show. Um, but I will probably watch the the Rick and Michonne show that's out right now. Because that's, I guess that's going to be kind of the finishing. Yeah, of I'm the whole curious. Thing. So if I were, I'm not so tempted that like I I can resist. Trust me. But if I were to go back and watch anything, that's that's the one I'd be interested in. Is right. what happened from the time that we quit watching to to the to the finale because it's over now, right? The the actual main show, mainline show, is ended. The mainline show is over now. Yeah. They're doing the Rick and Michonne thing. Yeah, so. yeah. So I would. And, I would almost be willing to watch whatever the last season or whatever I've missed just to watch right. that. But right. I don't and have, I think it's a, I think it's a limited series too, so it's not gonna yeah, be like yeah. ongoing. It's gonna be, you know, ten yeah. episodes or whatever they're doing and it's done. The only other one um is maybe the Daryl thing. Uh, maybe I'm not interested. but like <laughs> the only reason and I, I i didn't really think about it until i saw um the, was re-watching the walking dead when because you know in in the daryl show he's in in france i believe it's in europe and really? i don't know how he gets there so how's he in the france exactly what but when i was watching when we were re-watching and there's the episode where they're at the cdc the the scientist at the CDC is like, we think the uh, he, the last one that were standing was the the CDC version in France. Yeah, and they were keeping things going. And I'm like, I wonder if the show is like touches on that at all. Touches on that, like if that's why it went over there or whatever. So yeah, that's the only thing. Um, I'm the, not, you're not gonna do this to me, David. I'm not gonna give back in. <laughs> The, Ma- get back <laughs> the Maggie show, I'm not as interested in. Like, I mean, I yeah. love Lauren Cohen, but like, yeah, yeah, me whatever. too. She was, yes, yeah. Whenever we were watching season two, and it was getting to the farm. Yeah, I was. Okay, here comes my here comes my girlfriend, <laughs> and they were like, "Who's your girlfriend?" I was like, "Oh, you'll know when you see her." And I was like. I yeah. forgot who it was. Cooper was like, that's the girl you like? And it was like some random person. <laughs> like, no. Like, but like, that, that's, that's the zombie over there in the back. Yeah, right, right. And, and you know, what's, what's funny is, you know, when we used to do Talk the Walk. Yeah. I, I, you know, our, I think the one character that we both just like, other than Lori. Yeah. Was, was uh, Andrea. And. Um, I'm trying to even remember Andrea. Andrea. She was the blonde head girl that hooked up with the governor, and um, you would know her. If oh, you I do remember. Name. Yeah, yeah, I do remember. I remember oh, from the yeah. comics too. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like her and uh, she's with Michelle Dale, in the beginning. Like, she's like, yeah, she, yeah she's right. surviving when, yeah. And yeah, because that was the two people. I was like, yeah, I don't like Lori. I don't like Andrea. And Cooper's like, you know what? I don't like Lori, and I don't like Andrea. I was like, well. <laughs> Lori's gone now, so you only got the one to worry about. So. Yeah. The, um, and then I kept, I kept thinking about our conspiracy theory about whether Lori was alive. Yeah. And stuff like that. Like. Yeah. Uh, Hashtag Lori lives. Live, Lori lives. Free Lori. I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, memories of the old. Well, why did they kid. set that? That I, to this day, I don't understand. They were definitely setting up a plot that they just never used. Like, right? I kept think. I kept watching it over. Like when we were watching, I was looking for signs. Like, did I miss something? Yeah, and I don't think I did. Because like, there's the there's the scene where the walkers like sitting on the floor, leaning back, and he's got a big fat belly. Yeah, and like, I was like, there's no way that that's a whole <laughs> every he ate bit, every bit in, inside <laughs> of that dude. Like, no way. Like. And uh, <laughs> and then, like yeah, yeah, and there's just no like anything else. Like he doesn't look over and see for like, absolutely no whatever. reason. They teach one of the characters to do a C-section, right? For no reason. For no reason. It never yeah, comes it up. Weird. It's never important. 
Yeah, it's it's well, you know, Maggie insane. had to do it, and she's just. And the thing is, is like they teach her to do the C-section, and then like when Maggie goes to do it, Lori's just like, "Yeah, I know. If you do, if we do a C-section, I'm going to die." Yeah, and I'm like, well, why did it? I mean, other than you know, not cutting the baby, why did it matter? Like, how much yeah. training do you need to do a C-section? Like. Because yeah. Maggie did it, and she was just like, pull the baby out. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. But yeah, so um, I've been doing, like, that's been our nightly thing is watching Walking Dead. And then the other thing I got into, and I was like, so last week, um, uh, where I work, my job, like, I work for a university, and it was spring break last week, and there was literally nothing to do like i mean mm. nothing to do so like i started watching different things on youtube like different videos and and then somehow i got into um reaction videos yeah and like i just went down a deep rabbit hole <laughs> of watching people watch other TV shows. So what what the, TV shows have been spiking your interest as far as watching the, someone react the to that, it? The, the one that got me, and um, so the Mandalorian mm. TV show. So like, I, you know, for me, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Yeah. And like, um, with the prequels and then the sequel movies, you know, it kind of li- left a, a bad taste mm-hmm. in, in your mouth as far as what Star Wars is doing. And then, you know, what kills me is people talk crap about Disney, but then Disney comes out with the Mandalorian and Ahsoka and Boba Fett and all that, and they're just freaking really good. Yeah. Um, so you can't you can't crap on Disney about their movies. I don't and I, not give them credit on their TV shows. I'll give like, a high take here. I don't think the movies are as bad as people say they are. I don't either. I think people like people are way overreacting. Things. Yeah, way the overreacting. Only thing, the only thing I will say about the movies is they ruined Luke Skywalker. Other yeah. than that, I didn't think the movies were that bad. Um, I I didn't even well. So truthfully, I haven't seen the the last of the Disney trilogy. So I'm behind one movie. Um, right. So maybe I'm not a good judge of this, but from what I've seen up to that point, to me, the I thought the first one was great. I I, well, I watched it like four times too. in theaters. I teared up watching it with my mom because it reminded me of being a kid watching it with my right. mom. Like like I I I loved that movie, and then the second one was still pretty good. Like but, I think. Like I said, the second one wasn't bad. Yeah, and then I haven't seen the third one. But the reason why I have, but I think that I think there's a part of me that's avoiding watching the third one because people hate it so much. Right. Um, and maybe because, I think most, yeah, I think most of the hate goes to the second movie. Okay. Um, well, then I'm not scared. I should go watch the third movie then. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, and again, like you know, the two big characters for Star Wars are Vader and Luke, and you know, yeah. they. You never got to see Luke really be Luke Skywalker mm-hmm. because, you know, the original trilogy, you had him just becoming mm-hmm. a Jedi. And then in this, in the second movie, it's, it's the opposite. he goes up and he's on his way out and then he just yeah. fades off into nothing. And yeah. you never see that. But anyway, so like um, the Mandalorian, the... And I'm not. I, I don't, have you watched any of the Disney shows? No. Okay, no, so I'm not I'm a big Star gonna, Wars fan. I'm not going to spoil it anyway. Yeah. But like the the Mandalorian absolutely brought Star Wars up to the level it was with the original trilogy, and then the season two finale. I mean, I literally. Like you said, when you you teared up with that, I bawled in, <laughs> in that. I mean, it was yeah. it was so good. Like it was so good, and what they did in that that uh, that show and that episode in particular. And so I was watching YouTube and I, over on the side thing, yeah, because um, I was watching. Um, it was a breakdown of uh, a Game of Thrones thing. Yeah, and. Um, so on the side, I saw a thing that's like, uh, 
you know, re reactors reacting to season two, um, the rescue finale for Mandalorian. I was like, oh, so I started watching that. And then I had to watch a reaction for almost every episode, and then the Ahsoka show, <laughs> and then the Boba Fett shows, and then I started watching the Game of Thrones reactions too. Yeah. And then like, like, dude, I was watching like the reactions for um, that episode in The Mandalorian, and like literally like all the reactors, like these grown men are just like crying and stuff. And then I'm sitting at work, got tears coming down my face. Like when it walks in, they're going to be like, what the hell are you doing about here? I'm just um, watching Star Wars. Why do people watch Star Wars? Um, and then like, um, I got into this thing with Game of Thrones. There's yeah. this, uh, did you finish watching no. Game of Thrones? No. No. So there's this, there's this bar in Connecticut. It's either Connecticut or Vermont. I can't remember. It's up the, out that way. It's yeah. called the Burlington Bar. Okay. And they do, they had a, a watch party for every episode. Well, mm. it, it, I don't think they did it early. I think it, they, it, it more started um, like season four or five, something like that. Yeah. But like, it is fantastic watching like a big group of people watching it and like, yeah. Like, you know, all the crazy something would happen, like people go crazy. Oh, I imagine that is so much fun. You know, like, so I did that, and then, like, of course, then, like, you know, with YouTube, you start watching like reaction videos, like, yeah. every suggestion is going to be a reaction. So then I had to watch um, <laughs> cinema reactions to like uh, Spider Man No Way Home whenever, like, yeah, that's what Andy I was going to say. Comes through, yeah, or like, in a, in a and what is the end game when uh, Cap grabs yeah. the, grabs uh, the, the hammer? Yeah, and, yeah and, he, and he says, you know, Avengers Assemble, and it, people just lose yeah. their shit. <laughs> new game. Like, that's I, literally like what I've done every day when I haven't been working is watching that thing. And I'm like, but today I was like, man, I gotta like chill out. That's what, this that was what I liked about the first movie, though. I remember going to see it in theaters when it was still new and no one had seen it yet. And they pan over and they're like, what ship? That ship? And it's the Millennium Falcon. And everybody's like, ah! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's... Uh, then, I, then I kept thinking, okay, what can Bo and I react to? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, then, I, you know. I, um, I tear up for Spider-Man. Whenever my son is watching a Spider-Man movie with me, it's like reliving it, you know? It's, oh, definitely. It's crazy. When you're a dad, you relive all this stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> when uh, when freaking Tobey Maguire comes through, I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he was yeah, watching. Like, <laughs> my son's favorite Spider-Man movie is the worst one, though. My, my son's. Guess which one is his favorite? Spider Man Three. <laughs> yeah, that's his. Favorite. We've watched Spider Man Three so many times. It's his favorite one. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. He'll be like, mm -hmm. he'll be like, but Spider Man had to do that. <laughs> he had to. <laughs> right. It's so funny. <laughs> Tone for Grace is Venom. I'll no. tell you. <laughs> we've been on this subject too long, but. I'll tell you a reaction. So my wife and I got into watching reaction videos of like young, I say young, they're like teenagers, but it's teenagers reacting to like nineties rap music, like Eminem and Dr. Dre and stuff. And like, okay. just, you know, they're probably used to a different type of rap now that's like less complex in some ways. And so they right. hear like the double entendres and stuff that like Eminem would do or Dr. Dre and they're and they're like they're like they pause it, they're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. He just said <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> we crack up watching those things. A while back yeah. we went through that. We went down that lane. Yeah. So uh, another thing. Uh, <laughs> are you a are you a tool fan? Yeah, well yeah, to some degree. Greg more than me. Okay. But I listen right. to Tool all the time so when I run like, over Greg. Like if you <laughs> if you listen to Tool and like you listen to their lyrics, they're very like they're they're very in depth, like as far as yeah, Maynard. like what yeah, like what their what their songs are about. And another reaction thing I got into was watching 
uh, this people read Tuller. <laughs> well, it's a clinical psychologist, and she'll oh, listen to him, and uh, and like she'll like react to him, like what the lyrics yeah. and stuff are about, and like you know they get all into Carl uh, Carl Young and like all this stuff, and mm. it's like blowing my mind. Uh, yeah, you know, that was another thing I was yeah. doing was was music. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. So Dagger Heart to switch subjects. So. What brought this on? What brought it on my radar was this article by Wargamer.com, where they say that Daggerheart. <laughs> I put it in the show notes that they say Daggerheart is for filthy casuals. <laughs> that's not really. That's not really what the article said. Um, but they uh, they kind of say that hey, we played Daggerheart, and we got to say that it seems like it's for you know RP heavy groups that don't like combat. And, um, but, you know, they also go on to say that they're not saying that's a bad thing. And they kind of describe some of the rules and how it lends itself more to, uh, role playing than to tactical combat. And so I, I actually looked up the rules of the game and I studied up on, (laughs) it's actually pretty dense, um, which I guess we should say. Daggerheart is uh, Critical Role's new RPG that is in some ways a competitor to D&D. Um, and so it's uh, first off, what do you think about what do you think about that it's being considered a competitor to D&D? I mean, people obviously are making that comparison because Critical Role was such a big D&D advocate and then right. recently they they've turned and they're they're playing their own game now. So obviously you're going to compare the two just because of that history. Well, I think, you know, I, I would be interested. I haven't done due diligence enough to look it up. I'm, I'd be interested to know when they began developing this. If it's, yeah. if it's been literally years in the making or if it all started happening when the, the license issue kind of crept up. And they realized that they needed to do. Maybe they could jump on to like the fans that were losing faith in D and D, yeah. and thought, "Hey, here's our opportunity. If we're ever going to do something, you know, uh, th- this is the perfect time to jump into the realm, um, literally and figuratively." Um, and, and then, like. Um, you know, I was trying to it, see if I could find something online. It just says that they play tested it at Gen Con in 2023. Um, but at a glance, I don't see a date whenever they claim that they began they began developing it. They, my guess is that they it didn't take them long. I mean, you know, that's what they're in the business of, essentially. Yeah. So I mean for them to come up with a game, I you know, I feel like that for me, I feel like that's what happened, is that when all this stuff started happening originally, the the people at Critical Role were like, "Hey, here's our chance. We can capitalize on people, you know, losing faith in D and D. We come out with something." And I I like combat. I do, mm-hmm. but I like the stories mm-hmm. and that concept of maybe it be more detail story oriented um actually kind of appeals to me uh, as long as it's not like the gm is just sitting there reading a novel to you and you're just sitting at a table listening <laughs> yeah. or sitting online listening you, you want um uh oh god there's a perfect word for it that i just can't this is my covid brain is escaping me now i mean if it was like choose your own adventure book but mm-hmm. in game form and then occasionally you get into a fight. But if it's like, you know, you're doing this, you know, more of the, okay, you go into this room and, you know, you're searching and you find a trap or you find this. And it's more of like a, like a puzzle type, like a Tomb Raider type thing where you're, mm-hmm. you're trying to, you know, figure things out um, in, in that way. I like that idea. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and then you throw in a couple fights every now and then and you're all good. And um, so it may be something I'd be interested in at some point. It's still early and I guess it's still considered beta at this point. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the So one thing I saw is that they have a printable uh, play test, like starter set that you can you can get for free. And it comes with a lot of material. It comes with printable cards and little, you know, little figures that you can print and fold, and then you can put them on your on your uh, table. And it has uh, printable. Uh, the really one really cool thing I saw was that it has a uh, player sheet, character sheet, and then a like rule sheet that you put behind the character sheet. And if you slide it over to the right, then it, it has arrows and rules that point to the appropriate sections on the character sheet. And then if you slide it, you know, over to the left, it does the same thing for the other side of the character sheet. So I thought it was a pretty in right. innovative way to, to do that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, um, to me, it depends on the game. So some games I'm with you, Star Trek adventures, my players are never, there's not, there's not even a chance they're going to die. There's no, there's almost no chance. Right. Unless they get trapped or something, and they're like, there's nothing they can do but like, you know, don't wear a red shirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but the game is all about the story and the mystery of the episode we're playing, and like, you know, they might fail their mission, you know, which right. to whenever I used to play that game to those players, that was worse than death. They wanted to get through, you know, right. they wanted to get through the mission, solve whatever the mystery was, help the people, you know, come out the other side. Uh, you know, respecting the prime directive. And, uh, that was, that was the game. Um, and the tactics of the game were not like the, the very for first most thing. Um, whereas I think people that play Pathfinder, uh, they probably want more number crunching and to, to, you know, more tactical combat and their, those adventures probably involve right. a lot more combat and that sort of thing. Um, I like both, and to me, it just it depends on the game and the way and the rule set is sort of what signals which type of game it is. And um, it's actually so Star Trek Adventures is actually what I would compare. And now it's it's not fair for me to make this comparison. I've only played about you know I've only played th I've only played three or four RPGs, and I've I've only looked into maybe five or six in total. So like it's not like I have a huge library to pull from here. But there's a lot of similarities between this Daggerheart game and Star Trek Adventures, believe it or not. I don't think I've seen anybody say this yet, but or I guess but more specifically to 2D the 2D20 system. Um, so one thing is they have stress. It's 2D20 system also has a, a stress system. Um, they have what they call hope and fear, which is different in this yeah. game. It's like you roll hope and fear dice. And I don't know if the fear dice are used to like push a roll or or how the rule mechanic works that you might roll a fear dice versus just rolling hope, but there's times you would roll both. And the fear dice actually gives the GM like points he can use to make the situation uh, a little bit more stressful, a little bit more, a little bit harder. It's like at the expense of you pushing this roll, now the the GM gets to like add an extra enemy in this encounter or maybe the uh, the terrain is rough terrain because the floor is frozen or something like that um and that's also an element that is in star trek adventures and other 2d20 games they have um, a mechanic where um i'm trying to think of what it's called but but it's the same kind of thing if you need an extra dice to 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 do something you can spend a point of this particular uh, thing and now the DM they can use that point in the future for something bad to happen but in this moment you gained an extra chance to succeed um, and these systems like the 2d20 system is it's Star Trek it's Dune it's Conan it's it's these big IP right. titles where you're supposed to be a hero like you're not just a member of the society or in this world that just happens to be in this scenario. Like you are the hero of this story and you get to do a lot of really heroic things. And I think that uh, this, this game is probably geared towards, towards a similar experience where you really feel like you're the hero of the world. Um, right. It has yeah, no initiative. 
which yeah, is it's all that is like it's free it's free flowing yeah which again i don't know if it's all 2d20 games but at least in star trek there is an initiative but it's not your typical like you roll for initiative you can go in any order you can the players decide what order they want to go in right but in but in this in 2d20 you go back and forth so a hero goes an enemy goes a hero goes an enemy goes um until you're out of enemies and then you go through the rest of the heroes well, in this game, it's like the heroes can just keep going until they spend a fear. And then whenever they spend a fear, based on how many heroes went, that's how many turns the enemies get, you know, per number of enemies. Um, not per each enemy, but like up to the number of enemies. So, yeah, I don't know. If you, if you, if you just try to opt to not use fear... How does the GM like get a chance to use the enemy? So there must be something really, really right. heavy with this fear dice where you are going to use it for sure. Um, otherwise, that particular mechanic doesn't make sense to me. Like basically, the heroes could just go forever and just never use fear dice. Um, so there has to be a way to force them to do that. Um, and also, I, I heard a review from people that play the game that like you may choose to just like not take a turn because if you don't have anything really good to do on that turn. Why would you give the DM an extra, like, right? Like an extra turn to go with the bad guys? Um, so yeah, it, seems, it seems very. Uh, it, it's basically it was saying that um, each mechanic has a narrative edge, which encourages the players to consider the story implications of their moves. So yeah, yeah so like you know, like you said, if you don't make a move. That yeah. still implicates what the, what's going to happen with the story, or if you right. do, and then um, it's basically yeah, you you roll two d twelves and one's hope and one's fear, and then um, you it was to say you take an action or you make an attack, and they're labeled hope and fear, and they offer boons to the players or the GM depending on which dies roll higher. So if you're if your higher roll is hope, you go with that. Or if you're, you know, your yeah. higher one is, um, and I guess that's uh, what you were thinking about was the Warhammer Wrath and Glory. Um, that's another one that does that. But yeah, it, I mean, like it tracks the emotional toll of your adventures alongside their physical. Yes, that's um, the stress point. So yeah, the way they do that, and it's I hate to keep comparing it to one game, but I only. The, the the way they compare that in uh, 2d20 games is if you take a certain amount of damage or you're in certain situations then you will get stress points and then the stress points they like they affect your success and in, in future you know attempts um which i did find this interesting it said you know strategy aside it says that it has one major foil which is shyness oh which yeah this is for really have you have for to be social someone. butterflies. Yeah. 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 yeah definitely. <laughs> it says like if you don't I didn't think like, about that. Yeah. If you don't get engaged, you're just basically sitting there like yeah. while everybody else does something. Um so you have to it says, yeah, you have to be confident. There's you also have to be a confident gamer. They have a thing called experiences. Did you read about this? So experiences are basically things about your character. These are RP things. Right. Um, that you write on your character sheet and they 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 get like a I don't know how you decide the rating, but they get like a plus one, plus two, you know, whatever advancement. Um, and whenever you do something that matches that experience. So the experience could be um leave nobody behind leave no one behind or something like that. And then whenever you do something that reflects that character aspect, then you get right. like a bonus to doing it, which is also in Star Trek Adventures. That's something else in Star Trek. Okay. I'm telling you, there's a lot of similarities. I'm sure if I actually sat down and read the rule book, I'm, I'm basing all this just off of stuff I've read in articles and stuff. Um, if I actually sat and read the rule book, um, it's it's a fantasy setting. It's got to be a lot different. Right. But um, there's just it strikes me how similar a lot of these things are. And oh, again, yeah. I think it goes back to that thing where that, that is a very RP heavy game that is based on your character being the hero of the story. And this game is developed by a company that does live stream storytelling. Like these are, this is made exactly. for paid actors to be on YouTube 
You know, yeah. like like they they want to have the drama. They want to have the those character moments and be the heroes of this world. This is right up Will Wheaton's alley. Yeah, no, exactly. This is a this is designed for streamers. Like like live streamers yeah. would be really and that's not a bad way to market your game. If you no, in not. the in the game dev world, um, I know that one thing is if you design a game that doesn't stream well, it's almost destined to doom if you're if you're an yeah. indie developer because you need streamers. And so you almost need to design a game that encourages people to stream it in, in order for anybody to see it. And this could be like a similar tactic, although I think it is just by the I think it is by the uh, they're, they're doing a, a, a TV show essentially on YouTube. Yeah. And so they needed a game that would that would lend itself well to that. And this definitely does. Um, I don't think this game is necessarily for me, though, because there's a lot of really good games out there that are that have this same kind of element to it that are a lot less than 400 pages long. Um, right. This is a pretty dense book to be a rules light RP game. I think this is a rules heavy RP game, or it must be. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't actually read the book. For all I know, the entire book is all about how to be a better RPer and how to like play your character better and stuff. But you know, I, I just that's 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 some dense material to be this type of game. Um, well, the one thing I I think there's other games out there that do a similar is, thing. This seems like a game too that is going to be better with a big group of players. Like, yeah. I don't think you can have hmm. like three players with it. If it's so story driven and there's not as much combat and you're, you're relying on the characters since there's no initiative to do things. I, like if you have only like two yeah. to three players, it seems like you're having two or three people like creating the entire narrative where if you had like five players, yeah, and you get more input on things that it seems like it would flow better. Um, I don't know, you know, but hmm. I mean, it seems like an interesting game. Um, we'll see what happens after they do the beta and actually roll it out for real and see what kind of changes they make um, if they do make changes. And yeah, um, I'm curious how this affects uh, Dungeons and Dragons because, like, the resurgence, like the like. You know, we all talk about how like Stranger Things blew up Dungeons and Dragons. That may be true, but it, man, it's it might be fifty fifty, or or maybe even more with right. Critical Role. Critical Role became a huge phenomenon, and I think maybe it was yeah. like people got introduced to D anD D, and then they discovered Critical Role, and then they became Critical Role fans more than they were D anD D fans. Like right. There are people that like Critical Role is D and D to them. If you are not playing that type of game, they don't. It's not D and D. Right. It's some other game. Um, and and also that's why a lot of like old school players, like a buddy of mine, who is he's been playing for like thirty years. Um, he hates Critical Role because of that, because of how it affected how it right. affected. And I keep telling him like, but it brought so many people into the game. You have to appreciate it. Um, I've never really watched it. I watch a lot of actual plays. I, I enjoy it, but I've never gotten into Critical Role because it's, it's, it's to me personally, it's too produced. Like it's too, it's too budgeted. Right. Like I just think like they have so much invested in the success of this show that there's no way that this is like not slanted in right. some way. They right. know right. how the outcome is going to be in this storyline. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I I I think it's going to have a. It's hard to say that it's not going to have a negative impact on on D and D, given the recent state of Hasbro and everything that's been going on. Um, it's it's hard to say that it's not going to have a, a negative impact. But I think that also whether this happened or not, I just think that that huge. I don't think D and D is like going to die or anything, but that huge yeah. spike that we saw, like that huge spike that we saw in 2000 and uh, 2000 and 2020, uh, 2019, 2020, 
that I think that is destined to wane. Like no matter what happens, like it just it Definitely. was just a phenom. It was a flash in the pan phenomenon that had to happen, and the game will probably be stronger because of it. Um, stronger than if it yeah, hadn't happened, like, but it was going to die down. Yeah, I mean, one of the you can say a positive of COVID was yeah, this there's a lot of positives. Of yeah, um, like it was, you know. Online gaming and, um, you know, heck, even like uh, like Roll Twenty and and those companies just yeah blew up because I mean yeah. you couldn't go anywhere, and so your only option was to play with your friends online, and now that you you know now that there's more options and you know it, yeah. it's obviously going to wind down because now people aren't just sitting at home every day. Um, and, and I, I think Critical Role again. This is the next step that they've got to take to to try and keep their you know pocket of success that they've gotten, and you know it makes sense to to do it because um, then they keep it all in house. Like I don't know, I don't know, man. I kind of feel like this is like bad for everybody. I don't think it's good for Critical Role well, either. I, I well, think they like, have to. They have to think it is. Well, they definitely think well, they it is, so they wouldn't it. be doing it. Yeah, ex- right. exactly. <laughs> but I, I, I think that I think, I think they could be wrong. I mean, I mean, who the hell am I? But I, uh, I just, to me, it just feels like, I don't know. It, it feels, it feels like if if they're playing, if they're playing Dungeons and Dragons, then it's like, okay, we're playing this thing that people recognize. And we didn't make the rules, but we're using the rules to tell this great story. And you right. can join in and you can do it too, you know. Whereas like Dagger Heart is like, okay, we made this game and we made it tailored so that we can tell a great story and put on a good show. And right. you know what? You can get this and you can pretend to be us too. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't feel the same, you know? Um, it just, I don't know. I don't know. People... I think that Critical Role should have basically started playing. Oh, but they can't do that because they do this thing where they have like an ongoing story with the same characters because that way it's easier for them to market and like um, right. merchandise those characters um, versus yeah. like it would be interesting if they did like, okay, we're going to take the same actors and we're going to do other games and, you know, tell other stories. Um, but that's that's not how they run their show, and they and they. I mean, I think that that is part of the reason they were they were so successful was because they did it that way. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. My favorite to, of these. If I get bored, I might have to watch. You gonna watch some critical roles? Well, I might have to watch some of the Dagger Heart just to oh, see yeah. you know, what it's like and uh, see yeah. how they do it. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, like it also sounds like a Blades in the Dark or. Uh, something made off of the, uh, the I think it's called the Apocalypse Engine. Um, I have uh, I have uh, Monster of the Week, which I think is off of the similar engine. But it's like a, it is like a very narrative. Like you don't just have like a list of actions you can do. Then you do those actions. Like you, you narratively say what you want your character to do, and then you roll to see how successful you are. Um, right. And, and so that's a similar thing too. But again, it's like that game has like just a small section of rules. And then the rest of the book is all about, you know, like the world and, and setting up games and stuff like that. Other, you know, adventures and, right. and uh, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it is truly a rules light RP friendly game. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I, I'm, I'm curious how it turns out. I'll just yeah, say I that. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In literature news, Brando Sando has done a lot, as always. Brando I Sanderson know, right? makes it on every episode because every week he's 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 doing news. I know. I don't. You know that should be the topic <clears throat> of this segment. Is is Brandon Sanderson AI? How does he do this? Like, exactly. how is he a real person? Is this like an Andy Warhol thing where he's got like a team of people that do this under his name? Like, how is it possible? That he produces so much content, like it just doesn't. It's it's not humanly possible. I don't get it. I don't see how it is. 
humanly possible. He's what is it? Uh, in the other one, the um, the in uh, the Sun Eater thing, the the people that are part computer. Yeah, he's an extra solarian. He's yeah. an extra solarian. Like <laughs> Brandon Sanderson has to be an extra solarian. Yeah, he's he a, right to sleep. It's just churning out things. He's an eight foot spider. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, like, literally, like, I mean, <laughs> for people that follow him or who, who don't follow him, mm. he literally comes out with a weekly video, mm-hmm. and every week it's some announcement, and you're just like, how do you come up with something where you're literally coming out with a video every week, and every week it's like, here's something new. And he has here, it, he has it, out. he has it down to such a science, too, where he's like, I'm 75% of the way through this book, you know, it's right. like. He knows exactly <laughs> to, to a percentage. Like he knows exactly like how much he has left to do before this finally goes to publish. Uh, Whereas, like, um, I yeah. just saw a thing when we were talking about <laughs> Game of Thrones, where uh, George R. R. Martin said that he's only like eleven hundred or twelve hundred pages in. He's still got a long way to go for his next book. That he's been writing for twelve years. <laughs> um, he, they, this guy was like. He gave an interview <laughs> almost a year ago, and he said, yeah. I'm only 1,100 or 1,200 pages in. So literally in a year, he's written nothing, <laughs> if you go by what he says. And yet this guy's churning out 1,500-page books like it's nothing, along with all these other books. Yeah. So, I mean, like. It's so crazy. I want to I want to catch up on all the Brandon Sanderson stuff, but he's got to stop. He's got to stop so I, I can know, catch right? up. Um, so, uh, yeah, this was part of a, it's, it's, like, that's another weird thing is like this announcement was just part of some other backer kit that he's doing. So he was doing a backer kit for the like special leather bound version leather of, bound. uh, let's see, which book Words is Radiance. it? Words of Radiance. Yeah. Um, Those things are nice. Yeah, they are really they're, nice, they're, but they're expensive. <laughs> they're expensive, and how hard is it to get the ones that have already come out? Because I ain't right? just getting one of them. I got to get them all. Um, but as part of this yeah. backer kit, he also announced that, uh, let's see, he says, uh, he did it again. Uh, that's right. A new secret project by Brandon Sanderson. We won't tell you too much about it yet. After all, we want the story to speak for itself. But... Just know you won't want to miss it, to miss out. Um, so he announced another. He's written another entire book. And this it, is the and this is the fifth, the fifth secret project. Fifth yeah. secret project. Yeah, I have the other four on my shelf that I've never read. Right. Yeah. The only the only one I really at this point I've given up. The only one I want to read is the Sunlit Man. Um, yes. The rest of them. I'm just gonna. I'm just never gonna catch up. So I have the other ones are just shelf candy. Um, but the interesting thing about this one is he did a, a live reading of the prologue in like two or three chapters, and they weren't chapters back to back. It was like chapter like three, chapter thirteen. It was like it was like random chapters seemingly, um, and it tells the story of a dragon. So this this cements a dragon in the Cosmere universe, which is something that fans have been talking about forever. You know, these fantasy books are all written in the same Cosmere. Right. And they're high fantasy. You basically have paladins. You basically have rogues. Like, I mean, it's yeah. it's like densely, densely high fantasy, um, but no dragons. We had this little crim little they're giant uh we had crim creatures that were like dragons um right. and for a while i was just like all right that's dragons in in sanderson's universe he calls every bird a chicken he calls every dragon a, a crab um and uh now we have we have real dragons and i wonder if this is foreshadowing i wonder if dragons do you think dragons are going to show up in stormlight they have I mean, to right so like what is it like was the cream what was it, what was the cheery cheery like that's what i'm that talking about cream? they were like, like he was like a crab little scuttly dragon type thing cat dragon bug <laughs> yeah and then like, i don't know what um, he was called i don't remember 
Well, the, the one I'm talking and there was about bigger there, ones. They go to that island, yeah. and there's there's carcasses of big ones. Well, yeah, now those, but there's also like the bird thing that the girl in the what's her name in the wheelchair. Yeah, that cheery, she's cheery. got that's cheery cheery. I thought that was more like just like a chicken looking thing. <laughs> no, I think it was like a little crim creature thing. Because the crims could like form into basically. No, no, th those were the those were the sleepless that are made of little right, crim okay. bugs. Everything is crim in Stormlight yeah, Archive. Right. It's like <laughs> but yeah, like so, like when when in that book when they go into that um, that cave and they find yeah. the everything and there's the depiction of the of like I guess Cheery Cheery's like ancestor. Yeah, and they're that, huge. More than anything, kind of was dragon said dragon to me yeah and that's me kind of what i was thinking that cheery cheery was eating you know those rubies and stuff and getting bigger yeah and it was going to turn into like some big like she was gonna you know she's she's uh handicapped now and that she was gonna be like daenerys you know oh Targaryen yeah and riding cheery cheery yeah. and all this stuff i that's think that what, will happen i, was, I, think, I well, think so too. i think that probably will happen but uh, or what if, what if those carcasses were dragons? They just don't have any reference to a dragon to call it that, right. you know. And why do they call every bird a chicken? Why is every bird in Stormlight Archive a chicken? They have black chickens or crows. Uh, right. The one guy has like a parrot type chicken. It's like a colorful chicken. It's like a peacock. Like every bird is a chicken. That's just like a. That's just like a Sanderson sense of humor thing. He just thought it would be funny. Right. What if in what if in Roshar they just call every bird a chicken? <laughs> they don't have a word for bird or anything. Exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the weird, quirky thing. It's even in like dramatic scenes, like um, in Oathbringer, uh, some of the flashback scenes. Um, Dalinar encounters. Uh, a, like a flutter of crows or some, a murder of crows or something. And it says, right. it says a chicken fl fluttered out of the, a black chicken fluttered out of the bush. <laughs> so this says, so I, I just had to look up cheery cheery. Yeah. It was like, so identified as female, the creature is a small winged beast, a little longer than Risen's outstretched palm. She is the size of a large Kremlin. Yeah. Yeah, it has the snout, carapace, and build of a creature far more grand, an axe hound perhaps with wings. Yeah. A lithe little flying predator. What if uh, what if they're dragons? They just don't they're called, they're called a larkin. Larkin. That's the name of okay. them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What if they're dragons? They just don't know to call them dragons. Right. You know? Huh. I mean, that's definitely I mean, you know, we came up with dragon somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if you saw it was another interesting thing that they found in the uh, mountains in China, the fossil of what could be like over time kind of changed into what we consider dragon. Mm. It's like the first one of the first fossils. That it's kind of like the long elongated. Yeah. Thing yeah. like. In Chinese myth, and yeah. I actually found a fossil of something that resembles it. That's crazy. Uh, That's crazy. Right? I want so, to I mean, believe. They, right. I want to believe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, like the the chicken thing. Yeah, it's very strange. And and like, there's the green chicken that that uh, that they were chasing through the hallways, and yeah. there's like that red chicken thing. And it's just like, all different kinds of birds. That's right? every. I swear, like, Sanderson is a genius writer, but he's not funny. Every time he tries to tell, like, right. any humor expressed yeah. in Stormlight Archive is, like, not funny at all. Um, you just right. you just have to roll your eyes and read past it. It's like you're, you know, it's not even dad jokes. It's, like, great uncle jokes. It's, like... Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so bad. Uh, that's why Shalon was so hard to read in the beginning. Whenever she quit doing the humor to uh, uh, mask her... Uh, to veil her um herself it got a lot better um so like yeah just looking at the so you know he's done a, a lot of these uh backer kit things yeah um so just the words of radiance leather bound with the secret 
you know, project thing, just this one has raised $21 million. Dude, you know what's crazy? That's crazy. That's just this one. And he's done this. $21 million? $21 million. Oh, my God. $74,473. 86,000 backers. There's three days left. Holy cow. And their goal was $2 million. Dude, it's like, nuts. It's insane. Like, and, the, you know, the top um, level was $650, Yo, and that one sold out. Brandon Sanderson could run for president. Dude, right? <laughs> like, that's, I mean, literally, just... that's, that's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that is money that you would raise to, to, yeah, do your, to run your campaign. Run your campaign. Like, that's incredible. Like. And Dude. you got to figure, like I said, that's just this one. He's also <laughs> had all those other backers where he was raising tons of money, which tells me his followers seem to have a lot of money, disposable <laughs> income. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's crazy. What am I doing wrong here? That's what I'm thinking. How can, why, how does the $650 tier sell out? <laughs> yeah, what do you get for 600? <laughs> All right, let's look at that. That's a good thing. I want to talk about the yeah. Audible thing. We'll save it for next episode. Let's, yeah, uh, it let's. It says you get Words of Radiance Leatherbound, Dragon Steel <laughs> Prime, New Secret Project Box, Backer Pack, 10 Radiant Packs, and a free Dragon Steel Prime ebook and audiobook. Why do Which you get two? Weird. Why are you getting two copies of. Are you getting two copies of Words of Radiance? Well, you get a signed Words of Radiance leatherbound set, uh, a numbered copy, and then there's another six hundred and fifty dollar tier, which I don't. I've been trying to compare them, and it just says signed Words of Radiance leatherbound set. That's the first one's a numbered copy. Is it just that the book is so long they had to break it into two? Maybe because it guess. is crazy long. Yeah, I mean it shows. Volume one and volume two. That so. must be. Yeah, that must be what it is. It's uh it's just the book is so long that it break it in two. Can you imagine being at the you're going on a cruise? The only copy of this book you have is a leather bound set. And because I actually read this book on a cruise. And or did we read uh we read Rhythm of War on that's what I read on the cruise, but anyway, same same scenario. You're at the crease. You're at the part where you got to switch from volume one to volume two, and you don't know when you're going to get to volume two. So you end up having to bring both of these tomes with you in your right. carry on <laughs> the cruise. <laughs> it's, so, it's so unpractical, these books. You got to get it on a Kindle. You got to, you have to get these on a Kindle. <laughs> well, you know, that it, it comes with the, the ebook of it. But yeah, I mean, literally, you're buying that to stick on a bookshelf yeah yeah Any, anybody yeah. buying it has already read the book at this point nobody yeah, exactly. nobody's buying it like oh i haven't read this yet <laughs> I, th I need a new book what should i get oh let's spend fifty dollars <laughs> on two leather bound sets yeah and hope they're good hope, <laughs> hope they're good um yeah that's crazy like so, yeah, the, I mean, there's two $650 tiers, and the, it looks like the only difference is one is signed and numbered, and the other one is just signed. Yeah. So, I guess having it numbered adds value to it. Yeah, yeah, I can um, imagine so. I can um, imagine so. And then you got the $250, um, the... Again, there's two there's two different two hundred and fifty dollar tiers. And one two hundred and fifty dollar tier says it's a two hundred and fifty dollar retail value, and the other one says it's a three hundred and eighty five dollar retail value. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So like but yeah, it's blowing up. So I mean yeah. he's, he's doing one that. one thing they're doing on uh, oh that's if yeah, yeah, so it's for the secret the secret project. So if you if you back this project enough to get the secret project book five, um, you can get the audible. It actually is connected to audible now because of the whole, uh, right. Sanderson versus audible thing came to a conclusion. They, uh, 
there, if you have an Audible account, you can like somehow link your account whenever you get the uh, backer kit, and it'll add it to your Audible library. They probably just give yeah, you a coupon yeah. code. Probably give you a coupon right. code to get it or something like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, Sanderson, man, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, he could, he could run for president, and and just any time he, he's probably, he probably has a closet full of books he's already written, and he's just waiting on the opportunity. To just slap them on a table and be like, I did another one. <laughs> I need money for my campaign. Everyone, yeah. donate. Done. Uh, I guess that ships in... 2025. 2025, so yeah. Yeah, 2025. Um, that's crazy. All right, well, uh, we don't have enough time to get into the Audible story, and we really got to kind of make it quick on Howling Dark. Um, Which but, I mean, like, I don't think we need to really go into right. much detail. Yeah, about let's just it. talk we about kind of talk about how it's going. And like we we were talking about earlier, this book has changed yeah. so much from the beginning to where I'm at now. And like the it, it, in the first couple chapters, I would have almost said, okay, this book is not going to be good. And then all of a sudden, it changes, and. I, I'm all of a sudden heavily invested in it. And yeah. then all of a sudden it changes again to where I feel like I'm in some yeah. weird, like that's what the um, first, the first book did the same thing though. The first book kept like hooking me and then losing me and then hooking me again and then losing right. me. And then there's like, in the first book, there's like this whole period in the middle where I'm just like, I'm, 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 I'm lost. I'm completely lost. I'm just rolling with right. it to see how it ends at this point. And then again, and then it grabs me again. And well, like it, I actually think this book is not as bad as that. So far, everything I've read in Howling Dark, there's been nothing where I've said, I want to stop reading it for a while and right. come back to it. Um, but yeah, definitely. It's it's basically rolled over and changed like three or four times now. Um, well, there's part of it like like the, 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 I don't know how you call it, the, not necessarily the middle part, but the, the part where it starts... So when I say getting good, like a couple chapters <laughs> in, it's like a um, what, what's a space pirate adventure. Like you're fighting, like yeah. What's been your favorite? Life. What's been your favorite section so far? Um, I think the the part we're on now. Um, okay, from the time that they left the the um the, Lynn. the red. The, the yeah, yeah. When, when they left Lynn until now, and like I said, you, I'm a little bit ahead of you, and it even yeah. gets crazier scientific to where like I feel like it's like um, I don't know, like a Blade Runner type. Yeah, it's definitely thing. given. Like it, it's it's very very different. I can tell. Um, like we talked about how in the first book it was like almost fantasy because everything on. Uh, the planet Marlow world. I can't remember the name of the planet, but everything there was like really grim, dark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Emesh was the second planet, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, the first planet where you know he, uh, Hadrian is born is like really grim, dark, almost fantasy. Like they have like castles, right. and you, right, you know, exactly. it's it's in the future, but it's also very it's very like not in the future, and you could almost ignore it. And then they go to Emesh, which is um, like the plebeians of this, uh, you know, they're they're almost like a, a poor planet, but of a similar ilk, and right. it's more futuristic, but still, you know, but they get out of here with the extra Solarians, and uh, oh, and one thing I wanted to say is whenever they talk about the extra Solarians in the first book, I was picturing almost like the Borg because Hadrian has this like distrust of them right. the way he talks about them it's like they've given up their humanity to be these machines and stuff i thought oh they're going to be a bunch of mindless zombies like the borg are and it turns out they're they're not they're more technologically advanced than right. where hadrian's from and so one question i have is like how why are the extra solarians not in this fight with the Cielsen? Like, why is it like just the Empire that's fighting the Cielsen? Why aren't they using extra Solarian technology to, to move faster without having to go into cryo sleep? You know, like, like what? Why? Why no. is why the extra Solarians are just like disconnected from this whole thing? So, like, 
Now, the one thing you'll you will learn a little bit more about it, okay? Um, in the chapters coming, but you know, the chantry basically sees extra Slarians as demons that's what yeah. they keep calling like they you know like yeah if you've got a if you've got any kind of computer like with with Valka and she's got the, the yeah. thing in her head like she's still even though you come to find out that she's like literally about as little of what would be considered extra salarian as her oh yeah be, yeah she would still be considered to yeah. them a demon like but like the people that they're seeing now are just like you know, spider like characters, yeah. and yeah. Know, the only thing human about them is just their head stuck on some weird yeah. robotic thing and stuff. Um, so like, I think that's the main thing. But it does it will go into a little bit about um, so, what happens and what causes. And I think the main thing is like the. One is the Chantry would just wouldn't let it happen because they're like, I, I guess, human purists. And so, like, they wouldn't even consider help from yeah. the extra players. Now, the one thing that I have been questioning, too, and I still don't get it because, you know, they're there. It's the way uh, Hadrian talks about Vorgosis is like they don't even know if it's real, like. This is like a, um, like a place of myth, a place of legend. Like it, it may not even be a real place, and you know, they're, that's the whole thing. They're trying to find, yeah, like breadcrumbs that they can follow to try and get there. And then once they start going there, it's like they get on this giant cigar-shaped like ship, and there's hundreds of ships on there mm -hmm. all going to this place i'm like well and they, it seems like it seems yeah. like it's a pretty well-known place of like all these people are going there yeah but also it's like a myth so which is it like like i don't know that kind of like bug me and maybe there'll be more about it like yeah um, i don't think it's going to be like just a planet there's something up with there's something up with it it's going to be I think one of the reasons why it's not on a map and why no one can tell them where it is is because it's something that's always moving. Like I think it's like either a city ship or, you know, something like right. that. Um, well, I kept thinking, you know, like, um, like in a black hole or something like that, mm -hmm. like that you can't, or like inside of a, a nebula thing that like you can't get to, but they have some sort of technology that they can do that. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, I don't, there's the part where they talk about, um, you know, when, when they first get on that ship and they're like, okay, we're going to go into the, the, the cryo sleep thing. And the, the weird crab like dudes, like, you don't have to do that. It's going to take us like three weeks to get <laughs> yeah, there. And they're I, like, there's no way. Like how me, far away is it? Out of necessity. Like just that part to me, I love the book and I'm not like, I'm not going to stop reading because of this, but that part to me was like, a daunting level of disbelief that I had to put up with because there's no right. way I get it. The Chantry thinks they're all demons and stuff, but out of necessity, they would have to, they would have to concede that they need that technology in order to fight C. Elson. Like there's just, right. there's just no way there. They would out of, out of fear of extinction, they, they would accept that technology to fight yes. the Elson. Like, that's just hard for me to believe that like, you know, they're the, the Chantry is the like rulers of this like little pocket of the universe. And right next door, there's these extra Solarians that have this technology and they're worried about, about, about extinction level. Like, or does right. the Chantry mean extinction as in all of the Chantry dies? You know what I mean? Do they even it's care about the extra or or both? Or both? Yeah. Like, but, yeah, I just don't like, see how that is possible. The, when I think the Chantry, like, what always comes to my mind is um, medieval, like, um, Catholicism. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. early church, like, that yeah. was extremely crusades. corrupt crusades. Yeah. And they acted like they cared about people, but they really cared about power and yeah, holding yeah. power. And There's holding a, control. In the first book, tackles a lot of that where yeah. 
you know, Adrian. And I think that's part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because to to admit that you need help is mm-hmm. to admit that you're not all powerful. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, yeah, that's part of it. Um, oh, my favorite part of the whole book though was whenever they're escaping from Lynn's ship and. Oh, like Adrian that. knows he's going to stow away on this other ship and they want to steal the Cielsen, but they decide they can only get one. And then they, they have to like do this, pull this caper to get the Cielsen. And then it comes down to a confrontation and they're trying hard not to injure or kill anybody on the crew. Um, but then it comes to a moment where like Hadrian has to decide, like if he truly believes that this is much greater than him and much greater than um, you know, th- then he, he, you know, he comes to like, he has to make the choice of, do I, do I harm this crew in order to make sure that I stow away a Cielsen because it could possibly right. bring about the end of the war if we're able to make peace with the Cielsen, which by the way, I love that this book is, is about this, this book is an action sci-fi, like they always call them space operas or whatever. It's like right. that type of story, but it's centered around like this person that is just like trying to seek peace. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like, right. oh, we're trying to dominate this other race. Or we're trying to survive this uh, space Marine ship or whatever. Like, it's just like this guy is like, he believes that through communication and through like showing and, and presenting kindness that he can turn this whole world, this war around, which right. by the way, Nobody else has thought of this. Like Hadrian is somehow the only guy that's attempted this. Like that seems a little bit far fetched. Just Jesus Christ figure in the, <laughs> in right, the exactly. human race. Um, but uh, but that but still that whole scene. I love that. That's the concept. Um, and then also the whole scene where he's fighting Lynn on the scaffolding above everybody, and he cuts his right. arm off in order to get past him. Um, that was like Star Wars level. Like. Right. Uh, that was that was awesome. Probably the coolest moment so far. I think. And in, I that mean, essentially, they're fighting with lightsabers. I yeah, mean. yeah. I keep trying to picture these things, and I can't help but to picture lightsabers. Right, exactly. <laughs> like he describes it, and you're like, okay, lightsaber. it's like somewhere you can't between say lightsaber. It's like somewhere between a shard blade because they also talk about its material, but it's right. but it's like a. It's like a, a static vapor material or something, so it's also kind of like a lightsaber, like somewhere between those two things. But yeah, it's right. a it's a cool weapon though. Um, yeah, I I've, I all the stuff with the painted man, I loved all that stuff. That was really good. Um, it just really and took the, a left turn whenever it got to the to the uh, extra Solarians, and I'm I'm trying to get used to the new the new environment that that I'm in right now. Like I said, it it definitely gets more into like what the world is of Orgosos and mm. like it, and it's really cool and it's very um it's very Star Trekky, very like Yeah. Um like going into some surreal like mm. like I, I kept thinking of um you know, like a uh, V'ger in the original Star Trek movie. V'ger. Do you remember, do you remember uh, the very first Star Trek movie? I haven't. The, wa- I haven't watched much of the uh, TOS with, movies. Um, I'll know when I see it, though. Go ahead. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like um, again, spoiler if anybody hasn't seen this, but like. V'ger is the Voyager spacecraft that oh. went out into space, and then it basically evolved. Yeah, and then made like, like, like the the bald woman is basically like a a mouthpiece for V'ger. But yeah, like th- that's what I'm getting from this Vorgosis. Is it's like it's almost like a a mix of a natural and like evolved but electronic planet like it's it's computer driven but the computer ai is almost evolved and like 
It, mm. it, it's weird. You you'll get a lot more of it and more of an explanation, and maybe you'll understand it. But like, it's it's definitely. Um, you know, it's it's a very different place, and like I said, it's it's gone from I have an idea. gladiator pit fighting to <laughs> way over yeah. here to like you know C three PO and Data and like weird spider human hybrids and all this other stuff and um, one yeah, last. It's, it's, one last thing I want to touch on before we – and we can talk about something else too. I'm not saying this has to be the end. But the last thing I have on my list is the Oracle guy, the like extra Solarian Oracle yes. machine man thing that told Hadrian that his past was broken and right. that uh, – oh, what did he say about the eye? Um, he, he kept saying all this like – that was like Stephen King-esque. Like right. that part was really, really cool. Um, and I don't know what his past is broken. He mentioned uh, the woman. He, he, he like basically replays the voices from whenever Hadrian wakes up from the uh, cryo sleep that he, he takes um, in the first book, his first cryo sleep. And then that whole crew is missing. And we were like, there has to be a connection to that crew again later on. There's no way they just right. introduce those characters for them to disappear one chapter later. And I'm wondering if somehow they're, I'm wondering if somehow they're going to show up again. I mean, if, if he can go back to that Oracle and ask him what happened to that ship and that crew, what happened to those people, that guy should know and be able to answer the question, you know? Right. Um, you know, one of the things that I, uh, like was kind of, it, it made me think of lost when I was reading the part about the Oracle, yeah. which is weird, is <laughs> we relate like, everything uh, to lost. I know, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, the part where Rose goes to, um, well, no, it's, goes uh, to the fortune teller. The, it, that's, uh, when, uh, what's her name goes to the fortune teller, um, the pregnant girl. Well, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Name. I know who you're and, talking about. Um, and it's like... Um, he's not Samantha. What's her name? <laughs> no, God, no, right? Charlie and... <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. Go ahead. We know who you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> she goes to the... She, she goes to like the fortune teller palm reader dude and yeah. you know, it's a scam. Yeah. You know, but then like he touches her and like he has a real yeah. thing. And that's why I was getting... I thought like... Because he... Even Hadrian goes in there. He's like, "Oh, this is going to be like this is just some dude. Like, why am I even doing this? Yeah, this is obviously like some fake thing." And then all of a sudden, it gets real. Yeah, and like, so there's got to be more. Yeah, to that, there's got to be, and it has to come up again. But I say that. What if this this book goes on three more books, right? And then in the fourth book, Hadrian wakes up from Christ's sleep, and he's and it was all a dream, and his cryostasis. Because he kept the damn ring on whenever the guy told right. him to take his ring off. <laughs> he was dead the whole time. Yeah, oh, like, I did get an answer to that in this book, though. I said, I remember whenever we read that, I said, why did they Why did they even bring that up? Why did it matter that he had his ring on? That must mean something. Well, in this book, even though he's lost the ring back on Emesh, he has the burn on his thumb. Yes. And he feels the burn the he, same way he I, felt I, the ring. And yeah, so it did kind of pay off. It. Yeah, it did kind of pay off in in the end as being it's this constant reminder of his birthright and of his past and you know. And the one thing with past the is broken. Thing that, so like uh, you know you say th this has to mean something and I kind of said the same thing in the last book he, they go into the those ruins and he goes in that room and Yeah. Yeah, he interacts with whatever that thing is, or it becomes part of him, or whatever. And it's just like, okay, just forget about that. <laughs> I feel like he brought it up uh, recently in one of the chapters I read. He yeah. finally brought it up, and I and I think that may have something to do with what the oracle is saying. Is yeah. that whatever that did to him, like maybe it's kind of like the whole starting a new line and something yeah so, he's like 
he's his path only goes back to that part, so his past is broken, and now he's like some new, yeah, like kind of he's now a radiant and or whatever it is. This this whole book is about Hadrian's choices and why he made those choices, and I think that this this makes it like this is a living example in the story of like how Hadrian's choices are not predetermined. Like um, he, whatever from, from this moment on, we're to believe that Hadrian truly has a choice. Now, whether right. that means that the Hadrian that's writing the story, like maybe the Hadrian in the story we're reading could make different choices than that Hadrian. I don't know that it's that meta, but I think right. that it's just meant to mean that like, you know, it's it's not predestined. This whole book is about Hadrian's choices, and his, and his choices are real. And even this oracle could not see his future and what choices he might make, um, whereas other characters, I'm sure he could. Um, right. So I don't know. That, I, the oracle was a really interesting part and felt very different yeah. than the rest of the story. Um, I wish I could remember that saying he says, like we took his eye. Uh, so I can't remember right. what he said, but it was it was really cool. Um, I might have to go back and listen to that chapter again, or at least and, that and part. the whole thing at the end where um, where it kind of like goes into that weird loop and it's it's screaming out and the, that other thing yeah. comes in. He's like, "What did you do to him?" He's yeah. like, "I don't know." Like <laughs> that's definitely like, yeah, you know, it's something. Something there's a bigger meaning to that whole thing, and you know, who knows if he gets into it in this book or if it's something for later, but like, I feel like it's a very important, and it's a small section, but I yeah. feel like it's a hugely important section, mm-hmm. um, you know, going forward. So I, I really do like this book though. Um, I'm, I'm very much in the, you know, I want to get to the end of it, not just cause I want to get to the end of it. I want to get to the end of it cause I'm really interested to see what happens. Um, and uh, I like the, the description of this. It's a science fantasy space opera with cosmic horror. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a great description. Like, I'm like, I'm looking at the covers trying to decide what characters are what. This is definitely a C. Elson. Yes. Um, so the one on the, I know who the character is on this book is. Or uh, at least the oh. cover I saw. Or is this yeah. Hadrian? No. Oh, okay. That is not Hadrian. Because I, I thought it, I thought it might be because he talks about how pale his skin is. Right. Um, but I also can see that this character is extra Solarian. Yes. So you, that is actually, I just got to that part in the book. Ooh, okay. So yes, like when, when they met, when they when I heard the description, I was like, "Oh, the guy from the cover." <laughs> That's the guy on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so to give like a little bit of a bookmark check, you're a little bit further, but this is about how yeah. far I am. So imagine just a little bit further than that. Yeah, we're making good progress. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> It, it is weird that since I'm only listening to it, mm-hmm. it feels like it's. I'm only been listening longer, to it. Yeah. But like, uh, it's fine. Like, like I said, I haven't, I haven't been since the very beginning. I haven't been to a part where I'm like, okay, let's fast forward to this thing or mm-hmm. whatever. Like, it's you know. I'm still in the cycle where I listen to the same chapter two or three times before I finally move on to the next one because I'm listening to it at night and I fall asleep. But the right. voice, the voice acting is so good, I don't want to read it. But I'm just, uh, with, yeah, unless I'm driving, yeah. unless I'm doing something where I have to stay awake, but yet I can also focus on the book, I struggle to. Because, like, I can't, like, you know, I can't, like, play a video game and listen to it. I won't follow what's going on. You know what I mean? Right. But if I just sit there and listen to it, I'll fall asleep. <laughs> um, yeah. I need to take a long, I just need to take long drives for, like, absolutely no reason. Just go drive right. around. <laughs> just get on 85 and, like, go to... Go to Townville or something and come back. <laughs> right. All right. So well, what, go ahead. The so the you've got book one, book two. So there is a book three and a book four. Yep, I have up to book and four. 
book five. Oh wow, there's book five. Like if you look at it, you've got book one, book one point five, book two, yeah, book two point six, two point seven, three, four, four point five, five, five point five, five point six. Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, shorter stories. Um, right. I, I, I listened to an interview with uh, with him. I started to say Christopher because I didn't want to say his last name, but then I was like, we're not on a fr- we're not on a first name basis. So <laughs> I, re- I listened to an interview with the author um, and he talked about how after he wrote the first book and was still kind of going through the publishing process and wasn't sure when it was going to release, he wrote a second book and it follows um, the brother, follows uh, Crispin. Okay, Crispin. Okay. Yeah, so that's what 1.5 is. And then I've seen some short story books. Like they're called like Stories from the Sun Eater uh, franchise or yeah. something like that. And I wonder if that's what the Eater other theory. ones. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking we might should check out the Crispin book. It would give us more of what happens on on that planet with that family. Right. Um, what is the description of Crispin? He couldn't be the guy on the fourth book, on the cover of the fourth book. Well, I have no idea. I feel like there's just no telling. This story is going to go like places we haven't even we haven't even considered. Right, let's see. Fourth book, Kingdoms of Death. Oh, Kingdom of Death is the C. Elson on the front. Um, I guess it is the one, two, three, four. It's the fifth book. Fifth, Ashes of Man. No, Demon in White. Demon in White. Oh, this is the third book. Okay. I got them out of order on my shelf. the ones I'm looking at online have. Oh, and I do have five. Five is Ashes of Man with this woman yes. on it. Okay, now that's the cover I see here. Yeah, I mean, like, so far, like, I guess maybe book one is supposed to be Hadrian. On the cover, yeah, but we, he's got a big mask. He can't but see. He's got his a big face. mask, but I think everything else has to do with a different character. Maybe I don't know. So yeah. it could be like I feel like they keep mentioning like the his family. At some point, they have to come back in the story. They, I mean, like, has to, yeah. has to, like, yeah, I like, think he's gonna wake up from cryo sleep at the end of this book. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still believing he's in cryo sleep. Getting, getting crazy, stowed away. Right. <laughs> One of the crazy things that he does, I've noticed a lot mm-hmm. in both books, is that, like, he will, something will happen. Like, at the, when they escaped from the ship uh, with uh, Tanneran, and he's like, what's her, what's her name? Uh, what was the, what was his girlfriend's name? Like, Captain Ginn? Oh, or I. Like that. Yeah, I know you're talking about. I can't remember her name, but I list. You told me this, and I listened for it because I was a little bit behind you. He doesn't say he never saw her again. He says he never kissed her again. He doesn't kiss okay. her. Okay, so like <laughs> yeah, he does. I mean, he'll do that. Like you know, he'll leave a place, and they never saw her, him again. They never saw her again. He never is like, oh, yeah, like, there you go. Like, yeah, no, he said, uh, I never kissed her again or something like that. And then in the next chapter, he does see her again, but they don't kiss. Um, yeah. That's when he never saw her again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, about, it's the same thing, like, with Stephen. He's definitely got that Stephen King thing, like, and. Yeah. You know. You know and I and didn't know. The door, and yeah. And that was the last time I'd seen him alive. And you're like, yeah. what? <laughs> All right, well, let's end this thing. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for doing the show, David. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll come it. up with a name. Oh, yeah. What did we say? I liked it. Fireside Fantasy, Fantasy. Podcast. Fireside Fantasy Podcast. I don't know. We'll keep, right. we'll keep working on it. We'll keep working on it. That's a working title. We'll, des- we'll decide. We'll, we'll, let's, let's, give it, let's give it two more episodes, and then we'll decide finally what it is right all right <laughs> Sounds good. all right well anyway see you next week or maybe soon yeah. and yeah. peace uh, back is killing me because i stood up this whole episode <laughs>